Right, good morning, everybody. I uh, hope you are all well. Welcome again to another uh, Wednesday webinar session. Um, this is going to be a, a great session this time around. This is number four or five on, on the kind of the, the, the guest architect um, section that we, we're tending to do once a, once a week. And this time around, we've got uh, Zach Munro and Annalie Riches talking about the, uh, the, the infamous gold fit, Goldsmith Street 2019 Sterling Prize win, uh, winner. And, uh, and Zach particularly talking, he was on the Sterling Prize um, panel that we're, we're, we're judging it. So we're going to get Annalie to take us through Goldsmith Street, the, the project and its, uh, its development and what was great about it. And Zach talking about the, uh, the, the um, panel and, and, and how it was, you know, how, kind of how it was, how it was judged. Um, <clears throat> just by way of a, a bit of admin, if you can keep your mics on mute, that keeps all the background noise to a, a, a bare minimum. Uh, do feel free to, uh, to, to turn on your videos, but otherwise just uh, have, a, have a good old listen in. Um, by way of a, a bit of an introduction here, I'm, I'm just the MC. This is, this is going to be shortly over to, uh, to, to Anna Lee. Um, <clears throat> but what I'll do is I'll just quickly cover off uh, what, what Mesh Energy does just for, just for 30 seconds. We've got a lot to, to go through by the time 11 o'clock rolls around. But if you haven't been on these webinars before, I'll just briefly explain what Mesh Energy is about. We're a, an independent energy consultancy um, doing work in, in the UK, Europe and, and, uh, and, and beyond in the States, in fact. Uh, and, and really, we're, we're trying to collaboratively work with design teams to make sustainable building design more successful. Uh, we can help at any stage and, and, and absolutely come at it from the, the client's point of view. We're not sponsored by any manufacturers. We don't install anything, uh, but we can help at, at any stage trying to make sure that, uh, as I say, sustainable buildings can be better designed and delivered, um, but for everybody's benefit. So as far as what we're gonna cover um, in the next hour, um, as I'm kind of halfway through, I'll just do a quick intro. We'll then hand over to Anna Lee to talk about um, the actual Goldsmith Street scheme. If you're uh, familiar or unfamiliar with that, she's gonna take you through some of the some of the kind of key features and, and what went through um, the, the the team's mind and, and how it evolved to get to where it got to, uh, and then we'll we'll have a, a session with um, Zach talking about the Sterling Prize entrance. So we're going to cover off some of the other um, buildings that were uh, part of the um, you know part of the 2019 prize, uh, and and talk a bit about the, the judging and, and with particular focus on Goldsmith Street. And then we'll try and leave uh, 15, 20 minutes at the end for, for questions and discussion. Hopefully you guys will have a lot of questions. We use the chat box uh, through the presentation at the end to, to try and pick some of the, the questions out as best as we can do, try and get a load of those answered. Uh, and then we'll do a, a kind of a quick uh, roundup and we'll, we'll talk about next week. So without further ado, um, Obviously, Anna Lee is gonna, gonna tell you everything. Hopefully you need to, need to know about this scheme. But <clears throat> the thing that stands out here, um, the Sterling Prize, as far as I can tell, has been going since 1996. Um, there, were, there have been some pretty auspicious winners of the prize, including the American Air Museum at Duxford, the Scottish Parliament, the Bloomberg Building in London, and Millennium Bridge in, in Gateshead over, over the last uh, kind of uh, 25 years or so. And, the, the great thing about Goldsmith Street, which particularly stands out, we, we believe it's the first passive house scheme to have, have won the prize. But I think most importantly, and, and what was most written about, was it was the first 100% affordable housing scheme that won the prize as well. And, and hopefully through discussions with Anneli and Zach, we'll, we'll dig into that a bit more and, and, and try and kind of make sense as to why, um, you know, why that was indeed the case. So first of all, let's hand over to Anne Lee. Um, Anne Lee, if I stop sharing and you share yours, uh, we, if we do kind of, I don't know, 25 minutes or, or so on, on yours, see how it goes, and then we'll, we'll do kind of 10, 10, 15 minutes with Zach and then open it up for questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Doug. I've got, I'm home alone with an eight-year-old, so I'm, I apologize if there's any interruptions, <laughs> which generally is what happens. So you never know, I might be lucky. All right. Oh, 
Um, okay. Yes, I'm, I'm obviously going to talk about Girls on the Street, but generally what I do before I talk about it is I talk about another project that we did that had a massive influence on it. And um, yeah, lots of the ideas have come from a different project, which is one called Clayfield in Suffolk, which was another scheme for social rent. It was for Orwell Housing Association. And it was a competition, another RIBA competition where um, the brief was a deep green um, building in, in kind of use and construction. So low carbon in use and construction. The first time we'd ever get kind of come across a brief like this. And we teamed up with Bureau Hackle to try and work out how we could do um, a scheme that was essentially for a housing provider, it had to be low maintenance. Um, but make it kind of intrinsically ecological. Bureau Happold, it, it was before all this PHP modelling, so it feels really crude now, but Bureau Happold just said, well, look, try and face everything south and not overshadow each other in winters so when the angle's at 15 degrees, the, sun, the sun's at 15 degrees, and they gave us a percentage of glazing to the north and south facades to distribute. And that was kind of it, really. Um, and you know their, their, their thing was spend money on the fabric, make the fabric work really well. All these kind of additional bolt-ons, you know, photovoltaics are costly, maintenance heavy, and, and, and actually if you can spend that money on making the buildings in, intrinsically um, the fabric as, as green as possible then and, and as insulating as possible then, you know, that, that's the best way to spend money at that particular point. And actually given the advances in technology of photovoltaics, I can completely see that that was the right approach now. Um, so we, we came up with a section where, where we sloped the roof at 15 degrees, which is the angle of the winter sun. We, um, and oh, there we show solar collectors, but we, don't, we didn't actually um, put them in. So there's a section that's, that's arrived from the angle of the winter sun. And that's it, very simple really. Um, we arranged the build. It, we arranged the buildings in, on the site in the way that they didn't overshadow each other. That was harder because of the orientation of the site. Um, and we ended up. The only way we could make it work was with this kind of staggered arrangement of kind of barn-like buildings, where the taller building is to the the north and has a bigger space for it to cast a shadow. Um, we built our very first SketchUp model on this project and, and checked the um, sun. So it's very and shadow, so it's very kind of basic, um, and that's it. So if this, these ideas probably would have gone much further, to be honest, if Bureau Happold hadn't invested in a massive post-occupancy analysis of the scheme. So it was incredibly detailed. There were sensors in every single window. They measured sun. They took temperatures, readings. Um, it worked out how much energy people were using, electricity, heat, heat and water use as well. And I don't really have much time to go into that because it, but it was fascinating. And I think it was that that really made us kind of take a look at this approach um, again. So what we found out was that the buildings didn't perform as well with electricity use, water use. You, we cannot control people's behavior. Um, and if they want to have a massive TV and, you know, temp leave all the lights on, that's really up to them. But what we can do as architects is we can really affect the thermal performance of buildings. Um, so when, when Goldsmith Street came up again, social housing, massive issues with fuel poverty, we focused on doing another passive solar scheme, but at a higher density, um, which again led to challenge itself. So, um, so uh, Clayfield was 49 dwellings per hectare. This is um, 80, 82, 84 dwellings per hectare. So that was a challenge. How do we get um, this same approach, a solar approach on a higher density scheme? The site itself is, um, is quite near the city centre. You can see the castle to the right. It's about 10 minutes walk. Um, so this is Norwich. You can kind of see the ring road. So it's the other side of the ring road, um, but really close. And actually Norwich has really invested in great cycling infrastructure. It's a very cyclable place. It's very near to um, the housing on the left, which is called the Golden Triangle. It's one of the most popular places to live in Norwich. Um, it's when um, when we looked at it, it's rows of Victorian streets, 14 metre widths. Um, this is where most people would choose to live, um, very desirable, but we couldn't build it now with current, current um, you know, the 21 metre overlooking distances that we're required to provide wouldn't allow us to reproduce this kind of scheme 
in Norwich next to, right next to where this exists. Um, I could say a lot about that 21 meter overlooking distance because, but I, I don't think I have time in this presentation, but it's a random number. I finally found out where, it's come, where it comes from. And it's almost um, an undisputable fact when you're trying to develop outside L London, people have accepted that high densities require um, smaller overlooking distances, but outside London, it's very, very difficult to challenge this, this random distance. Um, so, but we, we realised that if we could build 14 metre wide streets, and very similar to the Victorian street, that, that this completely unlocked the site. So this was an RBA competition, so we were up against um, five other people doing this, and, we, and suddenly if you apply this street width, we could turn what would have been a, a scheme of flats into a scheme of houses um, with their own back gardens and it completely transformed the site. So this is obviously our solar orientation, we're facing everything south um, and we can provide kind of four rows of terraced houses with flat blocks at the end. And effectively this approach is what won us the competition because it, it was what the council needed really, um, housing need, two and three and four bedroom houses with with one bedroom um, flat. So that, that's effective. This, this challenging these distances um, allowed us to win the competition, but we couldn't change the overlooking distance. They didn't want to set a precedent. Um, so we had to adhere to it. So what we did was we faced everything south. So all the habitable rooms face the same way. <laughs> so there's no overlooking. There's only one, um, there's only one room on in each house which faces um, north, which is a living room. And we had to demonstrate that the overlooking didn't apply to those rooms. And, the, and actually Norwich had, had provided, um, had provided uh, blinds, um, kind of shutters for those, those rooms where they face onto a street. So we couldn't get over the overlooking distance, but we could, we could um, argue our way around it. But also because this was a competition launched by a council, we had a close relationship with the planning department. So we were actually able to to discuss this with them and find ways that they were comfortable with these distances, which is really unusual. Lots of unusual things about this, um, th this, this way that they set about this project. So we had this passive solar scheme and at some point in the process, um, Norwich said, could you make it passive house? And we'd never done passive house before. And we just said, yes, <laughs> um, thinking how difficult can it be? Actually, do you know what? We did have to do a lot of redesign of it because there are, you know, it's a calculation. I, I presume people are relatively um, okay with it, but it, it really is, um, it's a, it's a, it is a calculation, it's a spreadsheet, and it's, it's about the fabric and heat loss and heat gain of a building. So it only, it tackles that, it doesn't tackle any other sustainability issues like energy um, production or, you know, um, so what that meant is our walls got thicker, more insulation, that much better air tightness um, with an MVHR system that, that effectively um, filters the air with a heat exchanger. So that's it in principle. And all, it also calculates um, overheating from sun. So we, we develop these sunshades as well. Um, and on the site with our Rosa terraces, we were, I mean, another really brave thing the council did was allowed us to put in these ginnels um, we try to we try to introduce this idea on a number of occasions in different schemes, and no one no one would do it. I mean, I think the, the concern is from a client point that they're unmanaged space. What can happen there? They were actually part of our strategy for bins, um, you know, meter cupboards and everything. So they had another use. But um, so you can see in amongst the back gardens, there are these these spaces for for neighbours to meet. They're secure at either end, so they're places for small children to play. And I think one of the delightful things about us going back, because we've had to go back quite a lot to show juries around, is finding out how well these work and the kind of catalyst they've been for neighbours to meet. I mean, I think another thing to say about the site plan is we've got different areas of open space of different scales, and we have really prioritised pedestrian routes. So there are raised tables, people can cross roads safely. The roads themselves are very narrow, we work very closely with the highways engineers, another thing that never ever happens, but we had a great highways engineer. So the road widths are uh, three and a half meters. Um, no one normally would let us do this. They're, they're kind of like Victorian streets. You just have to wait for people. You have to wait for a bin lorry. Um, and they accepted this principle. 
Um, so it's a place with pedestrian priority. And actually when you go there, the kids all zoom around, that there's a kind of central pocket park and they, they all kind of scoot around and people obviously feel safe with them doing that. So this is um, what the space we call the ginnel with all the back gardens opening. And it really has been um, kind of all, all the kids know each other now. Um, I think it has been a catalyst with people meeting each other because these were people who didn't know each other when they moved in. So it's a new, they're new residents. Um, and, and then those two ginnels give out onto this um, central park, which again leads to the larger park, which then leads to a bigger park that we had some money to refurbish, um, which is to the south. Um, a view down the street, I think one of the kind of, everyone was worried about the street width. Um, when we, we've obviously been to kind of design review panels and everyone was concerned about the street width and the different heights of the different sides of the building because of the section. I actually think that when you see it, it feels a very, it's a very comfortable space. It's a, um, so it's quite interesting what people were concerned with in the reality, because obviously you take on board those concerns as a designer. Um, so the, the elevation facing south is different to the elevation facing north, um, which is part of the solar, solar strategy. It has bigger windows, it's taller. It has front gardens for people to sit in because they're south facing and actually people are using those spaces. There are table and chairs out washing. Um, people are really occupying them. There are, I think, 17 different front door colors across the scheme. Um, so they fit, hopefully, I think they feel like it feels like your own house. Um, and you can just see the bin stores, which we work really hard on. Um, so everyone has a bin store in this section. Um, and that house is, you enter straight into a large kitchen dining room, living room to the back, which is the, um, the room which is obviously faces north, the only room facing north. And upstairs, there are two bedrooms facing south. So these are quite wide houses. They're, they're six meter wide, which again is quite an unusual width um, for a housing scheme. Um, and that's the north facing type. So less fenestration because obviously heat loss through the north facing was more of an issue and there's no solar gain from the south um, and those plans are exactly the same except the doors in the on the other side of the plan so you come into a hallway and then into your kitchen dining room so the kitchen dining rooms always face south um, being passive house we have to we have to make really simple buildings you know the closer to a cube the better so we, we have to make the fabric on the outside, like the, the brick, do much more. We can't make dents in the building. It really, it really, you really lose a lot of heat through that. So, so taking, using the brick to make entrances, post boxes are within those entrances, windowsills are larger that people can sit on in gardens. So we try to really kind of maximize the, the, what that, that outer, cold outer skin of the building actually does for the building. Um, at the end, there are the one bedroom flats. These are, um, these, these all have their own front door. And I think that's kind of fundamental. I think originally when we designed the scheme, there was an idea that there would be market sale. They wanted to pepper pot it. It became all housing for social rent on assured um, long-term lets. Um, and, but this idea stayed with the idea that everyone has their own front door. Um, there are no common parts to maintain, which is the local authority is, it is great um, and is always a source of conflict. So everyone has their own threshold, their own post box. Um, and the way that these work are that the brown one's the ground floor. So you come in, walk straight into a kitchen dining room and then, uh, sorry, your, your living room. And then you have a kitchen dining room and bedroom at the back. If you live on the first floor, you walk into the blue lobby, which is quite a large lobby um, with space for bikes and buggies. And you walk straight up into your flat. And then if you're in the orange um, flat, which is on the second floor, you have a scissor stair that goes over the blue stair and you end up on, um, on the top floor and they get amazing views actually. They all get um, quite big balconies or a garden. Um, and that's um, at the edge of the scheme with looking down the street um, at them all. And I think, um, have I got something on materials? Oh yes, just quickly on kind of detailing materials. You know, everything has to be really carefully thought out if you're doing passive house. You have to keep the cold 
outer skin away from the inner skin. You have, if you're building in timber frame like we are with, with re recycled cellulose insulation, you have to allow movement. So every single detail is quite carefully judged to make sure that all those things work. Um, I think we've splayed the openings. It's a six, over 600 millimeter thick wall um, from, from one face to the other. So to splay the openings, it makes the internal view much better. You don't feel like you're in a tunnel. Um, so there's a lot of thought has to go into things like this and things like gutters are just simply, you know, we, we've, we've got great gutters, but they're just on the outside of the building. You know, the simpler you can keep it all, the better. Um, and what we, what we did was try and, you know, really simple details, really simple, repetitive, house types, but, but persuade the client to invest in quite good quality materials, materials which actually you see around Norfolk because of its close trading links with, um, with Holland. You see a lot of these pantiles and black glossy pantiles and, um, and then the gold clay brick was often used as a facing brick for, um, that's a seam of clay that runs along from Cambridgeshire. So all these materials are quite, um, quite although it probably looks quite strange, they're quite common in Norwich. Um, and because we were, we persuaded quite early on, we persuaded the client that, you know, we were, we were concerned about getting passive house certification with a kind of design and build contract. Um, so we persuaded them to do a traditional contract, which is almost unheard of uh, with the social housing scheme of this scale. Um, but we wanted to maintain quality on site um, and ensure that they, they hit that target. And they, they, they agreed to that. Um, and because we were in charge of that process, we were also in charge of finding cost savings. So when the inevitable value engineering happened, we were able to actually go and meet with suppliers and work out how they could achieve the quality of the, the, the finishes and the details to a, to a better budget. So the bricks are a massive cost saving. Um, the roofing material is a massive cost saving, three, 300,000 pounds over the whole project. And that was because we had the ability to Go and talk to people. I really, I really think it's a shame that we've lost all that with, with design and build. We just don't know who's supplying stuff anymore. Um, just, just to finish up, just a bit technical. I think as we, as this project has come out of a learning process that was incredibly valuable, we wanted to learn from Goldsmith Street and work out how good it was. Because obviously we didn't design it as a passive house scheme. It's a passive solar scheme that then became a passive house scheme. So we've done, you know, quite a lot of work to try and, you know, did we do the right thing, I suppose, is the question we ask ourselves. Um, I won't go into all this in detail, I don't think, but I, but just this is, this is a diagram that we found particularly interesting and it's had a big impact on how we now approach projects. So pass, the passive house is, a, is an iterative process. It's not a design tool. You do a design, you feed it in, it spits out a number, you adjust it, you go through that process again. So, so it's um, one day there'll be a parametric version. Um, maybe, I, I know people are developing more, you know, more, des more design tool, for, but at, at it, at, as it stands, it is a spreadsheet. So we took our existing model of goals history as we'd already got it and, and made it do some stuff to just work out what, what the best, the best thing would, would to do was so one of the things we did was rotate it was was facing south the best solution could we have faced it east and west um and the the above diagram shows the results of rotating a terrace of six houses through um 360 degrees and the blue line is the heat the heating required now um it's it's better facing to the south you need less heat um, than, than east-west, and that's really because of winter solar gain contributing to reducing fuel bills, which was something we obviously knew about from, but what, what really struck me was the overheating um, risk. So, which is the red diagram, They're, they've got different numbers next to them, so it's quite confusing, but, but it's, it's a massive um, difference if you face terraces east-west. You've got, you, you have a massive, the overheating risk is much, much greater, and it's much harder to shade from those directions. So I think this has had an impact on how we look, now look at schemes. Um, a significant impact actually, we've actually redesigned a couple, much to our clients' delight. Um, and other things like, you know, the value of, um, you know, overshadowing, what impact does that have on, on heat demand? 
and also terrace what's what's the benefit of a terrace you know we've realized that beyond four houses they're in a row there's kind of there is difference but it becomes negligible after five a five house terrace so again that's something that's we found really interesting um and i suppose that we wanted to really plot um plot Bolton street against the rb climate challenge again i won't go too much into this um they they, they, they this is what they publish um it's absolutely useless because it's got no numbers we tried to we really wanted to plot it in this diagram and we had to effectively redraw the whole thing um with 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 a real scale so what we found out from this exercise is really goldsmith street hits the 2030 target exactly now that's only nine years away um and projects takes you know can take nine years to happen we're not going to hit it unless we're building everything at those standards now is you know so that's my cautionary tale why aren't we building now designing now for the 2030 target um so that's how do i oh yeah um, yeah sure. really really interesting um really interesting annalee i think um yeah, we'll, we'll we'll get on to uh, we'll, we'll get on to Zach, but I mean the, the the data at the back end there is um, is absolutely key, and just understanding the sensitivity of design to actual practical, you know, what's going to happen if we design it like this? What's going to happen if we design it like that? And actually getting that getting that feedback increasingly, I think people are realizing is is critical to that design process to iteration rather than just designing something that looks great. How is it going to perform? And actually, getting some accurate feedback on that is uh, is critical. Using you know, using tools, you know, using something that you can, you know, using something's better than nothing. And 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 uh, obviously, there's 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 costs to be balanced, but you need enough, uh, you know, you need enough time and, and data and analytics to get a, a half decent result out. So um, great. Let's just keep asking keep asking questions. We'll answer them at, them at the end. Let's just go on to Zach. So Zach, if you're there do you want to share your um <clears throat> your presentation and we'll, we'll talk about kind of zoom out a bit and, and get back to the uh the other sterling prize um nominees for want of a better word uh, and talk a bit about the, the the judging there okay yes brilliant thank you very much i thank you everyone for giving up your mornings can i also warn you that i'm also home alone with three young children homeschooling so if i'm hit with lego or um you know Request for stuff, please forgive me. Uh, let me have a look at this. You can hear me okay? Yeah, sure. Yeah, go. Okay. Excellent, excellent. All right, so, uh, yeah, I was really, really honoured to be one of the judges, especially this year, uh, sorry, that year, uh, 2019, for the Sterling Prize. And uh, I'll make it clear, I'm not going to be, I'm not allowed to talk about the judging itself. So what I'm going to do is talk about the criteria quickly and then rattle through all the projects, including, including this one. Um, so very quickly uh, about the judging criteria, there, there is obviously there was clearly a marked increase over the last sort of five, six years in the importance of sustainability in judging the Sterling Prize. Um, and I think this was the year that it really became a fundamental part of the judging process. So no matter how amazing your building might be, if it isn't sustainable, it can't win. Um, I, I think that's clear in the in the uh, criteria. Very quickly to hit on some of those points, the 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 um, judging criteria are essentially architectural integrity, uh, usability, delivery, uh, and execution. Now within those, each of those have a, a sustainability aspect to them. I mean, architectural integrity I think is something that's you know the Sterling Prize has always been associated with, uh, and there's a question there of of how a project will delight its occupants and visitors, etc. Now that's an interesting one and it's relevant to, to this project, I think, massively so. Um, it's also talking about design vi vision, innovation, um, and then at the end of that, that particular criteria, there, there is a, 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 um, a sustainability statement from each architect. Um, and, and that has to be completed. Uh, and it also has to respond to the RBA 2030 challenges. Um, I also think in terms of usability and context, the second criteria, it must make a, make a significant contribution to its immediate environment. So that's very obvious in some projects, less so in others, uh, but I think it's also how you, how you judge that. The last one is delivery and execution. Now, 
this is, is, is this is also a really interesting one because um, criteria such as having not gone over time without good cause and being value for money and it does also include the type of contract which is perhaps something you wouldn't associate with 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 sort of award-winning glossy glamorous projects so i will go through the projects now um uh, having given sort of that small uh, amount of, uh, of context uh now uh so this was also in my view, a very beautiful, very interesting project. Um, I have to hold my head up and say I did actually go to college with Matt and Dido, who uh, who designed this. Um, uh, not that that affected my 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 view at all. It's the courthouse, uh, and I think you know, along with uh, Goldsmith Street, this is a really groundbreaking idea in terms of innovation. You know, to build a house out of a single material. This is the technical drawing. So. Those walls that are that thick, it's literally one material. It's a big block of cork um, that they spent years and years developing. Uh, I think it is, is an astounding, an astounding kind of feat. And to have that in a way that it will comply to building codes, that, it, that you won't have issues with moisture, um, that it's a farmed, harvested product. You know, no, no trees were killed in the building of this house. <laughs> let alone pollution and the rest of it. Transport costs possibly slightly high because it, it, it doesn't happen in England. But um, it was also uh, for Matt and Dido, a labor of love. So I think those are sort of well-documented, clear, clear aspects of the project. Uh, one thing that I was, uh, you know, and I, and I went there prepared to love it because having, having, having kind of seen how it was built, I thought, well, this sounds really interesting. And then being there and being explained uh, by, uh, by, the, by the three architects, how they how they built this thing, how they came to the process, incredibly methodical and, and a very innovative process, working very closely with the farmers and the, the manufacturers of the cork, and then uh, luckily being involved with the, with the partly research group, being able to kind of work through it. Uh, but the most surprising thing for me was, you know, we as architects, I mean, I mean me and, and my team, spend a lot of time making English houses as bright, as airy uh, as possible. Most amount of natural daylight, most comfort. And this thing is really dark, but really, really beautiful. Um, it was very surprising. I mean, I thought, yeah, you know, if you go into this room, it's going to be a bit odd. You're, the critical thing here, you can't really replace visiting a building, um, but you can just about see these photos. In, in a very bright internal building, you're very aware of what's happening inside the building. I have a, a, a well-documented obsession with the, the relationship with the outside. In this building, when you walk in, those views are like lit panels, you know, within the interior. So it, it just it became such a poetic project that I was, you know, it's the first one I saw and, and absolutely blown away by it. Um, but it didn't win. Very beautiful details. Uh, the next project is uh, Neville Holt Opera by Witherford Ma uh, Watson Mann Architects. Uh, again, an exquisite piece of architecture. Um, in terms of sustainability, well, it is reusing uh, an existing building, the courtyard of, a, of an old stable block, essentially, uh, as an opera house. Um, it uses natural light, which is incredibly unusual for a, um, for a theatre building. Uh, and and it's, a, it's, it's a stunning piece of reuse. Uh, and obviously, I'm, I, I think sort of the, the, um, you know, the state sustainability in a way you could you could imagine it may maybe took a back seat because it's not for house but its energy use was quite a complicated thing to look at and to judge uh to, to explain how that would work for performances um all of the machinery uh for emily was was brought in was mobile so it was a very hard thing to judge and and to sort of uh, uh, understand well how do we measure this then i mean yes it's reusing an existing building but it's quite a, an energy hungry uh, 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 monster when you're when you're you know, in a performance. So how do you how do you deal with that? Um, we 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 did wonder about the acoustic, but they were really really clever in bringing one of the school children who use this building because it, it is used by the local school to to um, on a program to kind of get kids into opera, into singing, and into music. And, and it was this very very emotional moment when this little school kid came up and sung uh, one of the arias from Puccini, I think, uh, and, 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 you know, we were almost in tears. And then she said, oh, you know, I love singing, it's brilliant. She wasn't, she wasn't a plant, they didn't bring some amazing opportunity. She literally, this had changed her life. So 
beautiful, beautiful project. One of the things that I think I would criticize about it uh, is the client's view to sustainability. And I think that's kind of, that was a great shame because a project this, this, this good, when you discover that actually it's sharing some of its kind of heating with the, with the pool uh, next door, which is a gas fired boiler or an oil fired boiler, you think, oh, come on, how much would it have cost to put in a few air source heat pumps or, you know, how, how hard was that? But nevertheless, a very, very beautiful, very worthy project. Um, and that's it in operation. That, we weren't there for that, obviously. Now, the, the, the next one is the Western. So it's Yorkshire Sculpture Park. It's Field and Fowls and Architects. Again, really, really strong sustainable credentials. You know, this is a, uh, a timber frame building. Um, uh, it's oriented in the right way. It's a very good piece of architecture, low cost, about 3,000 pounds a square meter for a, uh, a gallery, exceptional. Um, and it was, it was, I think in this case, again, an example of a client being, being really clever and actually quite brave. They took a chance on a very young practice um, and, and they accepted the constraints of sustainability. This particular scheme, one of the things I love about this that you won't be able to see anywhere that might be in the plan, uh, I'll dig that out, no, I think it is anyway, is that in the ground, um, uh, underneath the sort of higher part of the project is a sort of clay labyrinth, which is essentially a passive humidity buffer. So in galleries, it's very important, the humidity levels are really important. Uh, and the client accepted to have a passive humidity buffer rather than a humidity control. Uh, uh, and it means that they can only show certain works of art in there. Um, but it, it wasn't that constraining in the end, and, and they accepted that. So I think that's, that's, you know, that's a real piece of innovation. It's just behind, in, in this image, it's at the back, just where you, uh, where you can see kind of the earth ramping up behind that, that big bit of concrete wall. Uh, and you know, a, very, a very simple building, uh, very beautifully executed and very honest. You know, I'm a brutalist at heart and, and, and I, I love it when what the thing is made of is what you see. Um, I have a few more images on that, I will rattle through this. Okay, so this was uh, obviously uh, Roger Sturt Carbon Partners, the McAllen Distillery, the visitor experience. Now, what's lovely about this is this building isn't a visitor center, it is a massive distillery. So it's basically an industrial process uh, being put on show. Um, I mean, it's a really big project. It has a huge impact on the landscape. Um, I mean, it was, you know, it was, was kind of really well worked out. It, it was kind of, you look at the process and the energy that was being used to carry out this process and the energy that is now being used, then uh, yeah, that it's a really sustainable thing. My, I suppose my view is, well, if you're judging the sustainability of, of something you do, uh, you know, as a, as a, as a, as a, for a prize, you do have to wonder what, you know, the, the, the significance. And I am a big fan of Macallan whiskey, but I do question the significance of it in, uh, you know, in groundbreaking architecture. Though this was clearly groundbreaking architecture. Um, Daddy, I can't read anything. Uh, well, I'm really sorry if you can't read anything. I'll be with you in a minute, okay? Sorry about that, that's my youngest. Um, so I, I felt personally on this one, just to give my own personal view, I felt a little uncomfortable with the way the timber roof cassettes collided with the uh, steel structure. I think that was my, that is, is my sort of issue with the project, but it, that's, that's not one of the judging criteria. But the fact that it used timber cassettes, you know, in a, in a huge industrial building uh, is, is, you know, was, was really good to see, really positive. Too much of that. Um, no comment. Right, and this is also an interesting one. So Grimshaw's um, London Bridge Station. I mean, I think, you know, if, if you're measuring the sort of actual impact incrementally of a building, you know, on, uh, on its environment, the, the changes that this building have made, not to the community, it's a, which is actually huge, but also to the transport of Britain and the millions of people it must touch every day, mean that you know this has to be a great candidate for, for the Sterling Prize because it's it's it has a sort of huge huge impact uh, on on on, uh, on um, you know on, on its sustainability if people are using public transport if they're encouraged to if it works better and they don't use their cars and they don't use fossil fuels suddenly you're you're you know you're some way to solving the problem also you know unusual but lovely to see daylight you know in a in a in a lower concourse of the station. 
really, really great project, really well worked out um, with some very, very different constraints. Again, uh, and then obviously Goldsmith Street, um, which you've heard a lot about or, or, uh, already. I have to say, I was always, I, you know, I was always very keen on this, um, though, I, though my judging has not remained totally impartial, because I, I kind of think social housing for me is really a cornerstone of modern British culture and modernism and, 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 and where, where, where are, uh, let's say, non-traditional uh, architecture goes. So, you know, a, a big part of how we look forward. And I was very excited that for the first time in many years, forget the same time. Yeah. Oh, hello, sorry. Uh, the first time ever, uh, we're building council houses again. You know, that's, that's sort of, that's rather, rather surprising and wonderful. And I think, again, um, one of the things that you don't see from the photos or the images, you know, some of the projects may photograph more poetically, shall we say, but there are two things about great architecture, I think, that, 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 are, that are maybe less obvious, but are, that are prevalent here. Uh, I think one is that it, it isn't how prettily it photographs, though obviously it's a beautiful project, it, it is, it is, you know, the good architecture it does. It doesn't have to look good. Now, I'm not saying Emily in any way it doesn't look good. I mean that you know, I'm sure that there are more amazing buildings that get ch chucked on magazines than this. But it's it, that doesn't mean they're better architecture. This was clearly better architecture. The other thing I think you have to understand is is, you know, the, and he said it. You know, this is definitely your own house. That the attention to simple little details like a bit of natural light coming in in the hallway or you know a bit of light above a stairwell or, or you know the bin stalls um, they're tiny things and you know if you're judging a prize by the oh well who cares about the bin stalls well you know what the bin stalls are something you walk past twice a day every single day and they affect each occupant every day of their lives and so a small increase a small benefit in those tiny elements um, is a huge overall kind of change in people's lives. And we went in, you know, I went into this, um, the, the, one of the single bed flats and one of the houses. And, you know, these, these, these um, houses have, have transformed the lives of the people living in them. You know, they are, they, are, they are living better lives and they're paying tiny energy bills, you know. And, they, and, and there, is, there is, you know, if, if I, I mean, I have read a few sort of bits of criticism um, uh, very slight saying well you know they, they they you know it doesn't do like me you know it's all right but you know well I can tell you that it does utterly delight it brings delight to every day in the life of the people living in this building and I think it's again testimony uh, to, a, to a client I mean obviously to brilliant architects but to a client who, who says who says revolutionary things who says yes we'll have a traditional contract at a council who ever heard of that you know, yes, we're happy to have back streets. We're not worried. You know, we won't tell you that people we stabbed in them. We will. We will accept that they can work and they do work. And yes, we'll allow you to have large front gardens. So, you know, I, 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 I personally think this was a very worthy winner, and I was delighted that it did win. Oh, okay. Well, thanks, Zach. Um, I mean, I guess my my question would be. I mean, you know, it's brilliant to see the other entrance, and as you say, a lot of beautifully photographed buildings and amazing buildings there. But I guess. At the end of the day, Goldsmith Street won. And for, in your in your humble opinion, is there one standout, you know, reason? If you if you could only list one reason why, you know, that 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 project came out on top, so what, what would that be for for you? Knowing you know the discussion that went on, what, what would that one thing be that the others just simply didn't? No, no, so I mean, I, I you know I I think that you know it is a significant building. You know, I think. You know, we, I think we, we as architects, uh, again, in my practice, we get frustrated when we're designing beautiful things that are just for a private client, in a way. I mean, we love it and it's great work. But you're thinking, and what difference did you make in the great climate fight? You know, I mean, right. well, okay. you didn't. You made a slightly nicer bathroom or a more amazing underground, whatever. You know, this is a significant building. You know, it is a, it, you know, I, I'd sort of not given up hope, but I always went into architecture wanting to do so council housing, you know, affordable, be it or not, but, you know, housing that makes a significant difference. And I think if you, if you, um, you know, I'd sort of given up hoping a bit, you know, we had years of Thatcherism and then, you know, councils were vaguely 
kind of having kind of limits on well if you build a million houses we'll let you build a few affordable houses and that'll be fine mm. and, and and you know all the while we're using more and more fossil fuel and you're thinking okay so this is not really going anywhere but then suddenly there's a ray of hope you know a a council uh, uh, wants to go passive house wants to um build social housing uh, and you know and we'll put the resources in place um, and we'll we'll face the face in that direction and aligns everyone you think well hang on wait a minute there's there's a chance here there's hope so it's a it's a significant project and even if it yep. wasn't even if it was a private individual or a, or a developer doing a scheme like this mm. which i hope many will follow um it, it doesn't matter because it is a building topology that demonstrates you know, a definite way look this is how you can do it mm. you know and there, there, there have been some kind of ones that are kind of you know have done this but this is the first time a high profile project has said look here you can this is how you can do it and suddenly and i hope and it's resulted in in tons more work because you're thinking okay let's roll this out has it no oh no <laughs> <laughs> but 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 I mean the, you know the amazing thing is that it, it's obviously generated a massive amount of discussion. You know it's it's not um, you know I, I, I can't I I wouldn't admit to intimately knowing all all those buildings, but it, it's um, yeah I mean you know maybe it wasn't the obvious choice to a lot of people as you say because of the photography and the and the external PR stuff that that goes on yeah. depending on how good a particular practice is in branding something. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, discussion around it has been huge. So I'm acutely aware of time. Um, we've got we've got a, a good few questions here, which um, be great if you guys could kind of help. help. I just say thanks to Zach. It's really interesting, and you know, it's quite funny reflecting back. Obviously, I've been stuck stuck at home for ages, and it's quite hard to remember the giddy heights of that night and winning. Um, yeah. But we were so. I mean, obviously, our scheme should be ordinary you know and i think the perception of the press was it it was quite ordinary um it was just you know i think we have to acknowledge that it kind of was at the right place at the right time um but yeah thank you <laughs> thank you thank you to the jury for recognizing the i suppose the hard work that went into it yeah. i mean i don't speak on behalf of the jury at all uh, uh, jury at all but uh, you know i think you know it was obviously worthy because it was on the list <laughs> and, uh, weirdly, honestly, I reckon everyone expected it to win. Don't you? I, th I think. I think what I what I gleaned from the, you know, obviously there were people who didn't think it was the right decision. It wasn't ar architecture with a capital A, um, but I think it did give people a bit of hope mm -hmm. that it wasn't just about the kind of expensive, yeah, um, and and that that was a sea change really um, in 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 what previous winners have always been very high budgets obviously it's into an incredibly low budget um we didn't mention that can you remind us again the cost per square meter it's mm. 180 uh five pounds square foot so it's about 1800 yeah. pounds per meter yeah. for a passive house which is just you know exceptional. I, yeah I, I i would concur i mean that's the fascinating thing for me and this is the you know as, as part of the wider discussion disconnecting cost with energy efficiency and actually being able to hit, hit these targets um and this is something i've banged on about for, for a long long time so it's great to hear that number in fact that was the question that i asked guys <laughs> I, I was i was actually asking the the, the, the <laughs> per square meter so we reckon about 1800 pounds a square meter and, and i know there was there was a question on on construction as well so um, I know David, your 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 colleague Annalie's been answering some of these questions on your behalf whilst uh, whilst the chat's been going on. So there was a question about what was you know what was the building made out of and what was the insulation, and the answer was six hundred and twenty millimeters wall thickness. Yes. Kind of timber frame, yeah, wall, wall cellulose wall insulation, and then and then brick yeah. on, the, on the outer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then somebody asked about the, um, the the you know the analytics that you had done looking at overheating and and the studies and stuff. Um, was that something that you did in house, or you? I know you were working with Inhabit on, on on some of the energy efficiency stuff. Just explain a bit about how you did that analysis. Um, we paid um, Warm to do it. Um, okay. You know, because because the model existed already, it wasn't. Um, a massive piece of work, but we just wanted to find out if what what impact our decision to 
change a passive solar scheme into a passive house scheme had and, and was that the right approach because obviously mm. we need to we need to learn from the stuff and find out what we did right and what we did wrong yeah and and i, I know you you kind of skipped over the um poa or, or, or post-occupancy evaluation um piece and, and and that's an interesting point because now the sterling prize you can't enter unless you have that that data that that, that came out what a month or so ago just at the end of last year there's now criteria for the sterling price. So, you know, that's a that's a fascinating angle and a prediction that I made um, when we did last week's webinar was 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 Reba would be taking that up for all of its awards by the end of the year because it, it's the missing link in you know taking beautiful award-winning projects from from there to actually functional, beautiful, and and maybe some other things award-winning projects. And really getting the the holistic reasons of, of why it's won and, and making absolutely sure that it's performing as as planned i just wanted to say what we want to do is make passive house affordable so everyone's doing it so finding out how we can do that is i think really important to get more take up mm, yeah and 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 this is i mean have you guys actively done so so since you've learned off the back of that project is that something which have you been able to share any of those learnings? You've obviously learned from that internally. Have, have you done anything with other practices trying to share what you've learned in order to, to help them out? Has there been any collaboration since? Yes. Um, you know, we are trying to apply it now. I mean, we only got, we, we, it has changed a recent planning application. We've, already, we've <laughs> turned everything so that, um, I, I've done loads of lectures. Um, I think I think we do need to get that analysis, you know, out there. I think at mm. the same time, technology always catches up. So people are developing much more, you know, design programs that where, where you can do all that analysis mm. right in, mm. in when you're designing blocks of things. And so, sure. so yeah. <laughs> Great. No, no, I mean, uh, you know, we're 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 all for it. I mean, that's exactly how you know we believe that. I mean, that that's one of the fundamental changes to the design process in again in my humble opinion and, and us as a as a consultancy is if you can just just simply involve um the, the right people at the right stages early you don't necessarily have to spend more money you, you're just rethinking the design process and being more analytical yes it might take more time to design the scheme um but you, you know you make up for that time once you're on site and it's more predictable and the costs come in far closer i mean that that, that leads on to an interesting Question actually, did you guys? I, I know this was a you know quite a protracted thing between the initial design and, and, and you also made a lot of changes, passive house, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But did you find that you planned this more than you would a, a, a normal, you know, a, a normal scheme of that that type because of the you know because of the passive house nature and the and, and the strong performance targets that you were trying to trying to meet? Not really. We <laughs> we do, we do spend a lot of time designing things. I mean, I, it, noticing things like bin stores, meter cupboards. Um, I'm I am slightly obsessed with the negative impact those things have on on housing schemes, and um, we 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 do spend a lot of time on design. Um, yeah, I think we have to. You have to. Mm. Those are things that really let down housing. I think they're small. No one noticing that. That's the kind of point of it. I was really delighted someone noticed our road design. There's no yellow lines on the <laughs> Someone noticed that. We, we spent a long time make, you know, trying to design the space outside the buildings as much as the space inside. Yeah, yeah, I mean, great, you know, it, it, it's great. I've certainly learned a lot from hearing you, 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 you talk about the project, Annalee, and, and obviously Zach about the, the judging criteria. I think um, certainly one, hopefully people will go away from the webinar and do some more reading up about and find out a bit more about it. Um, but yeah, I say to, to both of you guys, um, massive thank you for, for sharing that story. I know 2019 seems like a long, 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 long time ago now, um, back in a, in, in a different world, but um, as hopefully as you both appreciate, you know, the, the, the difficulties over the last year have actually moved the sustainability discussion on, you know, leaps and leaps and leaps and bounds. And, and, and you know, that is one of the massive positives from, from last year and hopefully for many more competitions to come, this will hopefully become the norm rather than kind of stand out, oh, it's amazing, <laughs> that scheme, that, that scheme won, you know, hopefully more, more people will get on board. So um, just before I kind of wrap up again, you know, massive thank you to you guys for, for, for kind of sharing, taking time and uh, 
discussing the, between you the, the kind of the pros and pros and cons of it and uh, good luck in the future i'm looking forward to your next sterling prize uh, <laughs> <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> Annalee and, and david forward, I think. <laughs> um, Thank you. No, no problem at all so um just to kind of wrap up next week's webinar um we're doing a master class on um ground source heat pumps so david uh, from our side is, is going to be doing that um, so book in early for that. We've got the usual amount of tickets available, um, increasingly popular, the Masterclass series. So if you've got any questions at all on, on the different types of ground source heat pumps, you want to know how they work, where they're used, what's great about them, what's not so great about them, David's going to be taking you through in, in normal fashion and diving into detail about those. Um, Right, so for now, folks, that is that is it. Once again, massive thanks for your, your time um, and a reminder that the both of those presentations that you've seen uh, will, will go out to uh, everybody on the webinar today as well as a, a CPD certificate. So huge thank you again. Massive thanks for Anne Lee and Zach for spending their time talking to us and hopefully we will all catch up soon. So see you next Wednesday. Take care, guys. Thanks Bye. a lot. <laughs> bye, bye.